we'll wait a minute or so while people filter in and get their microphones and, and speakers up. Okay, I think we'll get started. So uh, welcome everybody to our uh, semi-annual uh, UW-Madison CV department uh, town hall update. I see many familiar faces, so welcome back and, and many new faces as well. So hopefully I can get you caught up a little bit on some of the exciting developments that are going on in the department. Our agenda for our, our meeting today is really to uh, give you some short department updates. I'll try to touch on uh, aspects uh, of the department that are really moving forward uh, this semester. Um, and then, you know, our, our honored guest uh, today for the second half of the, the presentation will be Dr. Whitney Liu, who uh, recently joined our faculty. I'll introduce her uh, towards the end of my updates. Uh, we do ask that you put any questions that you might have either on the departmental update side or during Whitney's presentation in the chat, and then those will be monitored uh, and we'll answer those at the end of the uh, presentations. So let's start with faculty news. So really exciting news. Uh, we just uh, closed in on two new uh, CV hires. Um, so this is uh, Dr. Quentin Dudley, who will start in January 2024. Uh, Quentin will really bolster the biotechnology side of our departmental research portfolio. His expertise is using plants and plant-derived materials uh, for making of value-added chemicals. So really uh, looking at sustainable chemical production uh, using plants and agriculture. Uh, Dr. Mai no, who will start next September 2024, uh, brings in more of a biomedical bent. Uh, she is really using aspects of material science, tissue engineering, and cell manipulation in order to build three-dimensional models that can be used for everything from developmental biology studies to drug toxicity studies. So we're super excited to have these two joining our ranks. That will bring us momentarily to 22 faculty. Uh, up from 16 just a, a year and a half or so ago, which is super exciting as we see the growth in the department. Um, but then we'll subtract one. Uh, we'll be down to 21. Uh, Regina Murphy is actually retiring Sunday. So in just a couple of days is her re official retirement date. So just a, a nod out to Professor Murphy. She started here in UWCBE in 1989. Uh, was promoted with tenure in 1996 and then became a full professor in 2001. And Regina, as many of you might know, was the only female faculty member uh, in the history of the department up until very recently. So she really blazed a trail uh, and, 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 and uh, brought some um, very valuable uh, perspective and expertise to the department. And she applied a lot of this as she became the first Byron Bird uh, Distinguished Department Chair. Uh, so she was a department chair that preceded me and she made a lot of big, big accomplishments uh, within the department. One of those I'll be showing you today is the update on all of the facilities uh, and, and renovation uh, things that we've been having going on in the department over the past year. Um, so uh, uh, definitely a, a great shout out to Regina and we wish her well. Uh, as she moves on to retirement. Now, I will mention that she's not going to be gone so fast because she wants to see some of these projects come to fruition. So she's already volunteering for a lot of different department responsibilities, even though she's now uh, received her emeritus status. Uh, a couple updates, uh, uh, new awards that I'd like to announce for the faculty. Uh, one of those 
uh, is to Sean Polachek. So Sean uh, was a recent recipient of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Kellett Mid-Career Award. So this is anywhere seven to 20 years past tenure and is a very prestigious uh, and very competitive award here on the UW campus. So faculty from all over campus are eligible for this award. And this, this award is really recognizing Sean's research, teaching, and service accomplishment. So a very uh, well-rounded congratulations to Sean. Matt Gebby uh, was a recipient of the uh, NSF Career Award. So the National Science Foundation, as you may know, funds a lot of our uh, faculty's research. This is really an entry level award called the Career Award that really is meant to jumpstart a faculty member's research career. Again, a very competitive award and definitely a feather in Matt's cap. He and his group are looking to investigate uh, how the solution environment can really affect CO2 reduction uh, in his electrochemical reactors. Undergraduate news. So our spring 2023 enrollment in total is 508 undergraduate students. So we've been holding steady around this uh, 500 student level. Uh, you may or may not know that there is actually a dip being seen in, in interest in CBE uh, uh, throughout the country. Uh, we're holding quite steady and I think we're competing very well for undergraduate students. We graduated 90 students last Saturday. Uh, most of these uh, are going to be August graduates after they complete summer lab. And I uh, just have a few photos here uh, on the screen. And, and it was really exciting because what the students and their families did, they started in Camp Randall around noon. Uh, that was a large whole university graduation. Then they walked over to Union South for the chemical and biological engineering banquet, which faculty, staff, and students and families attended. Uh, we had several hundred people. Hopefully you can see them in this image. This is probably double what we had last year uh, just coming out of COVID. And so it was really exciting to see everybody get back together as a community. The students were super excited. They ate a little bit, got their sustenance, and then they walked down to the Cole Center uh, where I met them uh, for the College of Engineering graduation, uh, where they actually get to walk across the stage and be acknowledged individually. And so that was really uh, exciting for the students and their families as well. Um, some uh, update on the, the graduate uh, student uh, front. I wanted to highlight particularly this spring, the student accomplishment. Uh, we have great graduate students. We actually have 36 new graduate students starting in the fall. So one of the biggest classes uh, in memory here at UW-Madison. Uh, but the, the graduate students that are here have received all sorts of, of really important and prestigious awards. So Carlos, Meg, and Elvis, uh, we're all awarded National Science Foundation graduate fellowships. So this then funds their, their stipend uh, while they're here at UW-Madison. Grishkesh uh, was awarded the 2023 National Defense Science, and uh, Defense Science and Engineering Fellowship. This is on par uh, with the National Science Fe Foundation Fellowship. These are all national fellowships with national competitions. Uh, Josh Dietrich, for his research, was one of the five winners of our recent Energy Research Showcase uh, presentations. And so uh, that was great news from, from uh, Josh. And of course, graduate students do more than just research. And so uh, one of the longstanding traditions we have uh, in the department uh, in, in memory of Professor Roggetts is the Roggetts Awards. And these are to teaching assistants as voted on by their undergraduate students uh, who did the best job in the classroom. And so I've got both our uh, fall and spring winners here. Uh, Ryan, Evangelos, Elvis, and Meg were spring winners. And then you'll notice that Jiang, Zach, Evangelos shows up again, uh, and Abdul Hadi were our fall winners. And so they get a nice certificate and also uh, a monetary award for their achievements. So switching uh, over to facility improvement, which has been one of the big pushes over the, for the department over the past couple of years. Um, I'm gonna give everybody an update on where we are in our renovation. So to give the high level picture, uh, for those who may not know, we're redoing the whole summer lab space. We have added space that we, we acquired from civil and environmental engineering to expand the space and have a two-story pilot plant area. And we're also renovating a large 
uh, open concept lab, research lab for graduate students and about five faculty uh, on the third floor. So I'd like to just take you through some photos to kind of orient you where we are in this process. Construction started in October. We're looking for substantial completion, which means most of the construction done and maybe not completely outfitted uh, throughout the summer into early fall for each of these projects. So to give you the idea of the vision, so the top right corner here is the architect's rendering of the uh, classical summer lab space. And I'll just point right now, it, it looks airy. You can see these windows up here. Um, actually, you may not have realized it if like me, you looked up and just saw a tangle of heat ducts and piping. You never actually saw windows, but this space is actually a story and a half down there. And I'll show you some really cool pictures of some of the completed work. So on the bottom is just a panoramic view of that old summer lab space with all of the bench uh, casework taken out. This was prior to the beginning of the construction process. You can see someone put demo on this, this wall over here. These are all gone. The space has been opened up uh, and reconfigured. So here again is our, our benchmark. That's kind of what we're looking to get. This is now construction um, after we've, got, we've gotten to the point where the floors have been redone. There are new uh, tracks for, for the water and, and other things in the floor. If everybody remembers the grates and, and the things that always lived under the grates, right? Uh, we've uh, redone all that. And hopefully you can see as you look across this floor, it's looking towards Camp Randall. You'll see a bobcat or, or a digger here on the other side. That's the new space that was acquired that I mentioned. So I'll, I'll zoom in on that in, in just a minute. Now, the really cool thing is it's actually there's sunlight coming in down here. Um, I know that I've characterized it as such, and uh, talking with many of, of the alumni, including many on this call, we, we use the term dungeon, you know, basement, you know, all of these things, right? Um, but hopefully you can see in these pictures, this is the story and a half. This used to be just completely covered by a jumble of uh, utilities. Uh, it's open now, a full story and a half. And the uh, bottle glass windows that you see over on the left, uh, those have been replaced by actual windows that let a lot of sunlight into the basement. So right now at the point of this picture, there are a few lights on down here, uh, but really most of the light is natural light coming in uh, through, the, through these uh, uh, more skylight type lights. As I mentioned, with the additional space or the expansion space, uh, this is uh, where the new pilot plant is gonna be. So orient yourself, the old summer lab is on the left of this drawing. There's a hallway still going to be in between. They'll be connected via the glass sight throughs. And here's the pilot plant, which is about two full stories of, of depth here. Now, it already was about a story and a half. They had to dig down another six to eight feet uh, in order to accommodate the full two-story rating. Again, here you'll see windows looking out into Camp Randall. Uh, so again, we're going to have a lighting, uh, you know, natural lighting into the space. So this is what it looked like a few months ago. Uh, they had the bobcats in there, were digging up the floor and then actually cut a hole in the wall to, to basically bobcat it outside where they then put it into dump trucks. This is a, the same uh, sort of view, but now you can see they're ready to pour the floor. Uh, hopefully you can see on this column where the old floor was and how, mar how far they dug down then actually to get that added space so we can put the taller equipment within, this, uh, within the uh, pilot plant space. And then this is what it's looking like just a few days ago. The floors are in. Uh, we're starting to do some of the uh, uh, HVAC uh, and building some of the accessory rooms uh, within the space as well. So we're really excited. Uh, actually, the construction noise has diminished considerably uh, compared to when they were taking these concrete floors out. Our friends that are right above the space in civil and environmental engineering complained a little bit, uh, but uh, I asked for their patience and the price of progress. The third floor lab, so this is a research space, a large open concept research lab. It might not be easy to see, uh, but this is 6,000 square feet of contiguous research space. Where this ladder is in the middle was an eight foot hallway separating some real small offices from very compartmentalized labs. And today's research is really done in a collaborative environment. So this is gonna allow five different groups come together uh, to share this space. And 
while we were going in to take pictures, some of the grad students who would be populating the space had snuck in there and, and really were excited to see what was going on in there as well. So a shout out to the graduate students uh, giving us some nice pictures. So just to get everybody on the same page, there's still some project uh, opportunities available. We're a, lo a long way towards our, our goal. So this total project is gonna cost about $12 million. A uh, majority of this is, is coming through um, philanthropy from our, our generous alums. And there are some naming opportunities uh, still remaining. And uh, if you, like some of my colleagues, want to contribute $1,000 or more, uh, you'll be recognized actually on a physical display in the renovated lab. Of course, the development folks always tell me, we'll, we'll accept don donations of any size. So uh, please feel free to reach out if you have questions about the project or any interest in participating. So with that, I will transition uh, to our, uh, our guest speaker, Professor Whitney Liu. So Whitney uh, joined us in January of 2023. So she just joined uh, in a few months ago. Uh, she did her bachelor's in chemical engineering at MIT. She then went on to do her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, where she worked with uh, Professor Balsara and, and focused on the thermodynamics and dynamics of block copolymer electrolytes. She then went on to do a very interesting postdoc. This was at the height of COVID. So uh, she was uh, gonna work at the University of Chicago with Professor Paul Neely, ended up staying uh, while working with Professor Neely and collaborating with, with, uh, with Dr. Ruiz at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, to do her postdoctoral work. Uh, she's really an expert in the design synthesis and characterization of soft materials. And she's been uh, really well recognized at every step of her, of her career. She wins lots of presentation awards. I think you'll see some of that today. Uh, she's noted as one of the rising stars uh, in new faculty in chemical engineering. And so with that, Whitney, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you so you can describe your research to the uh, audience. All right, thank you, Eric, for such a lovely introduction. And it's really great to be here today with all, all of these alumni. Um, I haven't gotten the chance to really meet you guys yet and interact with you. Um, so it's really great to be formally introduced and have some time to spend with you. So today I'm gonna give you a brief snapshot of what my group does and kind of what our vision is for the future. Um, my lab is centered all around thinking about polymers for a sustainable future and how we can reimagine what plastics currently are in order to promote sustainability and circularity. So Eric already talked a little bit about this, um, but a bit about myself. I grew up in Southern California. I went off to um, Massachusetts to do my bachelor's um, and then came back to Ber um, Berkeley and came back to California for my PhD. Um, I did my postdoc jointly between University of Chicago and the Molecular Foundry at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And then I started here in January. Um, so when I'm not in the lab or teaching or doing all these other great roles that Professor has, I love to cycle. So here's a photo of me cycling um, during COVID. That was a very big highlight of my pandemic time. Um, I also spent a lot of time with my pandemic princess cat that I adopted. Her name is Potato. Um, and if I was at home today, I'm sure she would have made a guest appearance. But unfortunately, um, we're going to talk to you from my office. So like Eric mentioned, the Lou Lab was established in 2023. So we're really new and what we're focused on for this past semester was really working on building a new lab and also building an awesome team of researchers that is a multidisciplinary team that will enable us to do the science that we imagine. So here I'm showing what our lab currently looks like. I think we've had a few updates um, since this photo was taken, but still a lot of renovations, which is another major project. Um, that the department is ongoing and doing for my research group. So our labs are up on the fourth floor of Engineering Hall. As you can see here, we installed the only 12 foot fume hood that is on campus. And this fume hood is a specialty item that I'll need to do a lot of high, um, high volume polymer synthesis. And then on the right, what I'm showing is our, our small research team that we have right now, my graduate students, Jenny and Marissa, who are working with me to kind of bring this vision to life. So first I'm gonna start with kind of a step back and ask, you know, why do we want to study polymers and why are polymers an important and interesting material? 
Well, as chemical engineers, I'm sure you are all very well aware that polymers are all around us, um, from textiles, from our single-use plastics. Our whole body is comprised of biopolymers like DNA and proteins. Polymers are used in adhesives and even high-value products, things like medication, filtrations for um, water, as well as used in our batteries for most lithium-ion batteries in laptops and phones today. I would say the two targets of my group that we're really trying to focus on right now is thinking about how we can address the issue of the accumulation of plastics waste, as well as thinking about energy storage. So for those of you who don't remember, maybe aren't working as chemical engineers right now, we'll take a brief, a brief snapshot about, you know, what is a polymer and what do I consider a polymer when I think about designing these experiments and designing my research. Um, so when I think about polymer design, a polymer is a molecular structure that is comprised of many repeat units or MERS. I'm showing those monomers or repeat units here as these nice little spheres. And when I design new materials to characterize, you know, I have a lot of different degrees of freedom that I can think about when I design my polymer. I can think about chemical functionality that I can prescribe within these monomeric subunits, things like maybe hydrophobicity, maybe things like charge density if I want ionic materials. I can think about physical properties of each of these subunits, things like molecular volume, maybe molecular stiffness. And then what makes polymers so different from small molecules is have this added degree of freedom of chain length of using many of these repeat units and stacking them together um, in order to add different types of properties and functionality to my material. I can make things a little bit more complicated and start working with copolymers, which is one of my main expertises. We're now instead of one type of monomeric subunit, I can have two. We're denoting these different types of chemicals or chemistries between the red and the blue beads. And I can think about things like architecture, you know, how these different beads are arranged with respect to each other. I can think about things like connectivity. And I can also think about things like compatibility or the thermodynamics or the energy um, mismatch between these red and blue beads. Now, all of these design requirements really go into play when we think about what we want our bulk properties to be. Um, so when we measure polymer bulk properties, we're not thinking about single chain components. We're thinking about hundreds of thousands, millions of chains, and that's where we can design things like mechanical strength, maybe ionic conductivity if I'm thinking about batteries, or even degradability if I'm thinking about um, thinking about sustainable or biodegradable materials. And I would say the main focus of my research is really understanding and trying to link how this nanoscale chemical structure or how I draw these polymer molecules, you know, just in cartoons like this, really will dictate what macroscopic function and properties I can get out of these materials. Now, the current research, like I mentioned, is really focused on this idea of promoting polymers for a sustainable future. My research group has two main directions. The first is novel sustainable materials. So thinking about designing new classes of polymers that are more easily processed or recycled. Um, maybe they're built from monomers that come from more sustainable feedstocks than our typical petrochemical materials. Or maybe even thinking about how we can invoke and use sustainable manufacturing for different polymer based materials and films and semiconductor manufacturing and a variety of different applications. We also do a lot of research thinking about the circularity of the food water energy nexus, so this is a thinking about how we can promote sustainability. Through the design of polymer based devices that support one of these three areas, these are applications like polymer electrolytes for rechargeable batteries polymer membranes and hydrogen based fuel cells, as well as ultrafiltration membranes for water treatment. So what do we what do we do every day in my research group um, first we always start by synthesizing our own polymers we make all of our materials in house so we do quite a bit of organic chemistry in our lab. And we use a variety of different living polymerization techniques that give us precise control over things like sequence things like um, chain length um, in the materials that we synthesize. From there, we use advanced characterization tools to really dig deep and probe these polymer properties all on the nanometer or that molecular monomer level. Um, our exper expertise really lies in spectroscopy and scattering using x-rays and neutrons, so we can really understand what's happening on that spherical monomeric subunit length scale. 
From then, we develop structure property relationships that allow us to connect what we're seeing on this monomer length scale to bulk properties that we measure with the hopes of designing next generation polymer materials that hopefully have more improved properties than what we're currently seeing. So now in the last few minutes here, I'm just gonna talk about two ongoing projects or upcoming projects that my group is currently working on to give you a brief or more snapshot of actually what we're doing. So one of the projects that my current graduate students are working on is developing a new class of polymer electrolytes called polymer blend electrolytes. So right now in current rechargeable lithium batteries, you know what I'm using, what we're all using right now to watch or give these presentations and what's connecting us to one another, the electrolyte material or the material that transports the ions between the electrodes is this combination or mixture of organic solvents as shown here. These solvents are highly flammable, which is why we see battery fires, and they're also incompatible with higher energy density materials like lithium metal for us to really move to higher energy density batteries. So what my group does is we take inspiration from this mixture of solvents and we design polymer blend electrolytes. We're now instead of mixing two organic solvents together, we mix two non flammable polymers together, we still add an ion so that we can have an electrolyte material. Um, these polymers again are non flammable and they're compatible with higher energy density electrode materials like lithium metal and sodium. So then from there, we really try to determine what's happening again on that monomer length scale. So we use neutron scattering in order to observe and measure the monomer level friction of these polymer salt complexes in order to ask the question, which polymer species is going to contribute to ion transport. From there, we can use a different type of spectroscopy called Raman spectroscopy to probe the local polymer ion environments to understand where the salt molecules are partitioning in this multi component system. And then finally, we can use electrochemistry to really measure and understand how does this material perform under large currents with the hopes of really answering this final question of how does ion transport occur in this multi component polymer system. An upcoming project that we're hoping to start soon is developing reactive block copolymer compatibilizers for mechanical recycling of waste plastics. So currently, um, there's been a really, you know, there's been a lot of new insight into this unsustainable plastics waste accumulation problem. Polymers are a relatively new material. We just celebrated their 100th birthday in 2020. And so when we designed these materials 100 years ago, having them last a long time really brought a lot of improvements to global quality of life. But now modern polymer scientists need to think about how we can use sustainable practices to reduce the plastic waste or design new materials that are more inherently recyclable. So one of the issues with recycling polymers is polymers don't like to mix. Um, so what our group does is we develop polymer compatibilizers that induce mixing between polymers of unlike or different types of polymer components. Um, in order for in order to allow them to be recycled together, um, we hope that this will eliminate some of the work that can go into recycling and make it a more energy efficient process. So what my group does is we synthesize different types of compatibilizers. These are block copolymers that have favorable interactions between the plastics we're trying to recycle together. So we design and synthesize those compatibilizers. We then use high temperature extrusion to extrude new resin materials. Um, these new resins will then allow us to mix immiscible plastics and develop a new novel material that can be used. And then we quantify the performance of that new material using mechanical performance testing, such as tensile testing, to really make sure our new material properties are on par with what we're currently using in industry today. And so through this project, we're really trying to address and see if we can transform plastic waste streams into new high value polymer materials in order to improve the circularity of a life of a single use plastic. So that's all I have um, today. I'd be happy to take any questions about any of these projects, um, my background or my science philosophy in general. And I really thank you for your time and your attention. So, are there any questions uh, for Whitney today? Hi, I, 
I don't know if I can just jump in. I have a question. Um, this is Hari Nair. I thought it was a really interesting presentation. I lead I lead packaging actually for um, Procter and Gamble, the entire um, one of our larger businesses, and I'm particularly interested in your research on um, single use uh, plastics because this is an area. And I'm I'm wondering, is there anything novel approach that you're doing uh, that might be worth at a more commercial scale? Looking at things like sachets in the Philippines and things like that, because this is a this seems to be a problem that we can't seem to really innovate our way out to new business models. We'd love to get them to use something else, but a lot of the world is actually using these uh, single use sachets. So I'm interested if if your work and uh, what you ultimately might go into that direction. Yeah, you know, I think I think that's a great question. And you know, first I just want to you know remind the audience that we're a very new lab. Um, so yeah. a lot of this is, is research plans and things that we hope to achieve. And, you know, as engineers, you all know that science never goes according to plan. So we're still very excited to see, you know, how we're going to apply a lot of these, um, a lot of these ideas. I would say something novel that we're doing when we're thinking about these copolymer compatibilizers to induce mixing, and I didn't talk about it too much today, is we're trying to use either ionic interactions um, that will generate electrostatic forces within the melt in order to increase or in order to decrease interfacial tension between two unlike materials or design different types of in situ reactions in order to physically bond these materials together. And so I would say, you know, this work is very much motivated by the giant pile of plastic waste that's out in the Pacific Ocean right now. Um, and trying to find something to do with that plastic waste um, versus thinking about a new novel type of material that would be more inherently recyclable from the start. Thank you. Hey, I'm, I'm Div. I, I work in uh, at Moderna, also in like the biopharma space. So lots of single use plastics, but from a, for a different purpose. Um, and single use plastics, um, especially in Moderna and other companies too, it seems um, it's very valuable in the pharma space because we can turn around more batches. We don't have to do cleaning validation and stuff. So I, would, I guess, and sometimes even I'm, I'm in process development and the amount of plastics we waste, I feel is a lot as well. So I was just, again, wondering if there's any research going towards that on um, recyclable single use plastics for the biopharma industry, I suppose. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think that's a really interesting case study of where we can start to apply these new concepts for kind of reinventing what, you know, what a pipette tip is, you know, so that it's more easily either recycled or reprocessed. You could imagine that, you know, maybe, maybe you don't want to wash them yourselves, but there are facilities and there are methodology and processing techniques where you could clean and re-sterilize thousands of them at a time. And I think at that scale is really gonna be the only way where it's actually possible. Um, so the nice thing about this um, single use plastics issue, maybe it's not nice, is I would say right now, polymer scientists are really motivated to solve it. We've seen um, all of the dramatic quality of life improvements, thinking about water bottles and how we can transport water into places that don't have plumbing and don't have fresh water. Um, we know how big of an impact these materials have had on really improving the world. And now we have this next challenge in this next generation of trying to reduce some of the negative impact that those materials have and really think about designing new materials with end goal or end of, end of life in mind. And I guess a follow-up question, I guess specific to the biopharma industry, I think, what might be more attractive is biodegradable plastics rather than recyclable. Um, because a lot of this stuff also um, is like biohazards. So for example, if I do an experiment in lab, like all my tips, all my single use bags are going in biohazard, which just gets incinerated, which I imagine also has a negative impact on the environment. So a better way to, I guess, handle that waste stream um, because it's really, uh, shocking working in industry and how much plastic you just dump, basically. 
No, it, it really is. And I spent my time in a, in a bio lab during my undergrad and got a firsthand glimpse at all of that. And, you know, I think, I think the biggest question with biodegradability is what, what time scale? Um, because you can have things that are biodegradable, um, but those aren't going to maybe become fully compostable or fully biodegradable for 10, 12, 15, 20 years. If you think about those polylactic acid, the PLA, little plastic cups or cutlery that we use right now, you know, that we say are, are biodegradable. Those, you throw those in a landfill, they're not going to degrade for about 10 or 15 years. Um, and maybe that's okay for plastic cups, but, you know, we can't, that's not going to be suitable for large quantities of bio waste. We can't just hang on to it for 10 or 15 years and wait for it to go away. Um, so with those types of applications, we're really going to be looking at thinking about stimuli responsive biodegradability. How can we turn on biodegradability when we're done using these products in order to, you know, signal to the materials that it is, you know, end of life. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any uh, last questions for Whitney? I saw good communication in the chat. Uh, lots of people getting reacquainted, which is awesome. Uh, did I miss any questions in the chat? No, I think we're okay. Well, if you come up uh, with anything for myself or Whitney, feel free to uh, contact us uh, at any time. And thank you once again, Whitney, for uh, introducing us all to your research. Thank you everybody for attending and hopefully we'll see you uh, either on campus or at another town hall meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Eric.